Glory to God. If you're joining us on FATV, welcome. We're glad that you're here today. We are continuing in a series from the book of Revelation. A series from the book of Revelation. We're not actually te teaching the events out of the book of Revelation, but we're actually looking through the book of Revelation to find out what we must be doing in these days. Uh, there's many books you can get out there. I encourage you to do so. Uh, we will probably within the next month or two be showing the the series from Pastor John Hagee on the four blood moons uh, here in our sanctuary. And uh, I'll let Pastor Hagee do all the teachings of what's taking place and, and when it's happening. But even at the end of watching those, you can have the knowledge of the end times. The question is, how does that impact our living? And so today I want to talk about end time living. If you have your Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. We were preaching from there last week. And there's some more I want to pick out of there for us. Revelation chapter 16 is talking about the seven bowls of God's wrath. And all of the things that are released in the book of Revelation, all the judgments that come, are the consequences of man's uh, actions. If anything, God has been merciful and patient so that the consequences of sin in our personal lives and in the life of our country and in the life of the world is delayed. Because he's merciful, it hasn't happened sooner. But the day of the Lord will come. As I said earlier in our offering, God started the book of history, and he's going to finish the book of history. In chapter 16, move down to verse 15, Yeshua is speaking, and he says this, Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him, so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. What an odd thing in the book of all the things that are going on in Revelation and earthquakes and, and the earthquakes getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The final earthquake, it says, levels every mountain. I mean, you can't imagine that. Half of Jerusalem will be destroyed in that earthquake, but all the cities of the world will be brought down. Think of an earthquake that literally shakes the entire planet. Absolutely amazing. And in the midst of all these things that are going on, he says, Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him, so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. The contemporary Jewish Bible translates it this way, Look, I am coming like a thief. How blessed are those who stay alert and keep their clothes clean so that they won't be walking naked and publicly put to shame. Like a thief, it doesn't say he is a thief, Yeshua obviously is not. But he's going to come like a thief, and therefore what do we realize is that Yeshua is addressing the unexpectedness and the suddenness of the end. The unexpectedness and the suddenness of the end. In Matthew chapter 24, beginning at verse 36, Yeshua is teaching, and this is what he says, No one knows about that day or hour, speaking of the end times. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, Keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, 
If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Teaching about those end times, what is the instruction that Yeshua gives to his disciples and followers? It is that you're not going to know the time, so you better be prepared. You better live your life in readiness all the time. I've used this as an illustration I know before, but when I was a young boy living in Germany, my dad was in the military and we were stationed there, and it was in the days of a Cold War that looked like that at any moment it could get hot. And so all of us American dependents were taught to keep a suitcase in the closet packed. That if all of a sudden the command was given to get out of Germany and head to France, they didn't want us to even take the time to open the drawer and try to pull clothes out. You kept a suitcase packed. In that suitcase, you had uh, three days worth of clothing. You had water, maybe some, I don't, they didn't have food bars. I don't know what we had, crackers or things in there. But you could, you could get ready to leave because if all of a sudden the Russians decided to come from East Germany and cross the border, that the NATO forces that were lined on that border, our, our own military, uh, our artillery and infantry, would try to delay them. But while that delaying action is taking place, we got to get the civilians, the American dependents, out of there. And so you had to live in this constant state of readiness. Can you pick it up and leave? Do you know what you need to have? Would you grab the important things or the unimportant things? When things happen suddenly, the biggest word that is expressed by those who are impacted by that suddenness is, I didn't know, or I wasn't prepared. I had no idea. It's amazing because there are times when you should have an idea. I would have thought that watching a man spend 70, 80, 100 years building an ark would cause you to want to know why he's building the ark. And though you might laugh at him and say, you know, this is crazy, it's going to rain and flood. See, they had never seen a flood. It didn't rain like that. The, Earth was watered from the mist coming up. There was no such thing as rain. What, what do you mean it's going to rain and the rivers are going to overflow and it's going to flood? They had no concept of a flood at all. But it would have caused them to wonder, well, why are you building an ark if there's a flood? Because I'm going to get in it. And all those who get in it will be saved. But if you don't get in it, you're going to be caught up in this flood and drown. Don't you think you'd want to say... What are the requirements for getting in the ark? Uh, uh, imagine. And, and, and suddenly animals start coming to that ark two by two. Supernaturally drawn by the Spirit of God. Do you think that should at least get mentioned on late night news? We don't understand it. But elephants are, are coming and giraffes are coming. And they're all going to that crazy man Noah's ark. Sometimes it rains here we have a big rain and somebody will say to me was it raining hard i said well i don't know but i just saw two elephants walk down the street and two giraffes following them you know wouldn't that get your curiosity wouldn't you begin to say what's going on wouldn't you want to know shouldn't that have been news of the day but it says in the bible that they just went on living as if everything was normal and then it began to rain and rain and rain and rain and rain they still don't with the first drops of rain I think I would have said that man Noah may be crazy but I think he understands something I mean I've never felt rain on my forehead before the people of the world didn't know what was happening until the door of the ark was shut 
There came a day of a suddenly. The suddenly was everybody's laughing or everybody's talking about Noah. But the suddenly came when God finally said, the animals are all in the ark. The food is in the ark. Noah, take your family, get in the ark. And then as people must have been watching it, there they are, CNN is out there with its camera crew. Noah stands in the door and waves goodbye and walks in. And an unseen hand shuts that massive door and now nobody can enter when the suddenly comes if it's then you decide to deal with it it's too late Matthew chapter 25 turn there with me Matthew chapter 25 another parable you know if there's anything that Yeshua taught he constantly talked about that things are going to come suddenly, unexpectedly, and describe to us what we need to be doing in the face of that message. Matthew, chapter 25. You know this as the parable of the ten virgins. Beginning at verse 1, at that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourself. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others came also and said, Sir, sir, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth. I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the hour or the day. Keep watch, because you do not know. That was an illustration that Yeshua used that all the Jewish people understood. In those days when you got betrothed, I would have come to uh, Donna's parents and said, may I marry her? And they would have said yes, and we would have signed a ketubah. Now, legally we were married at that point, but we didn't officially have the ceremony at that point. Legally, we were married. If, if what I got to do now is I've got to go and get my house ready. I've got to get the house ready for her to live in. In many cases, I had to go get my field uh, established. I had to go make sure all my business deals were done. Come on, I, I had to get all that done. You know, in the Bible, when a man got married, he took a year off. So now that they've said, yes, I've got to get everything arranged so that I can not work for a year and have enough money to live on. That was the man's responsibility. Okay? I got to get that house. So I go off and, and, and I'm getting ready. And then there's going to come a time when I'm going to go back to get my bride. I'm going to go get her. She's living with mom and dad. I need to go get her. And so when everything's ready, and I might not know it's getting ready, it's coming close. It's not something that I put a date on the calendar. I'm work. Listen, if I have a ketubah and I want to be married with my wife, how soon do I want her to be with me? Soon. Sooner than soon. Amen? So do you think if I said, okay, well, I'm going to do it. Uh, well, I'll go get her on February 15th. Do you think if on February 1st everything's ready, I'm going to spend 15 days saying, well, I could have come, but oh, no, no. I'm doing everything I can to what? Not lengthen the time, but to shorten the time. Let's get the buildings built faster. Let's make sure all the accounts are in order. Let's, let's do everything. And then all of a sudden, I get up one morning, and that day I realize 
everything is done. What can I do? I can go get my bride. I am going to send people ahead. They're going to have shofars and tambourines, and they're going to start making a procession toward her. I'm getting decked out in my finery, and I'm coming. I'm coming for my bride. I don't have a cell phone. I can't say, hey, sweetheart, I'll be over there at 3 in the afternoon. Get your bags packed. Get ready. I'm going to show up. And when I show up, ready or not, here I come. <laughs> She's gone. I'm ready. Okay? I mean, you, you, you would go. I'm going to take her. We're going to have a celebration. The rabbi's going to bless us under the hoopah, and we're out of there to my house. Right? Fine house, my fine house. Okay? So, so the, when he's using this illustration, they understood. Now, Donna would have around her friends, virgins, whose task was to watch for the bridegroom to come. Why? God forbid. He's coming, and that's the day she decided to go to the beauty parlor, and she's not at home. God forbid that one of her friends came up and said to her, Donna, great ocean swells up at Wells Beach. Why don't we go up there? Well, I don't, you know, I don't know when he's going to come, but great, I'll go, to, I'll go to the beach with you. And she's at the beach, and I'm there to, no, no, no. So there would be appointed friends of hers whose job was to watch for the bridegroom coming. Watch for the signs of his coming, you know? What are you going to, you're going to hear shouting in his village. Now, if he's from the same village, hmm, you're going to hear a commotion going on that end of the village. But if he's somewhere else, maybe one of you say, well, listen, I have a sister who lives in a village halfway. Uh, you know, uh, you know, she can keep, if she hears noises that the celebration is coming, she'll run ahead and, and tell the bride he's coming. And in Yeshua's parable, this is a sudden experience. But see, most of us see most of us can't understand that. We look at a wedding and say, how can it be sudden? How can it be unexpected? What you do today? Well, you know, I got up this morning, didn't know what I was going to do, and noontime I thought I'd get married. So I had a wedding. No, no, no. I mean, we don't do that in our culture, you know. But he got up that morning and said, I'm ready, let's go. And off they go. And here comes the celebration. And right away, those who are ready are going to say, great, let's run into the house. Everything we prepared, we got all the, the, the things for meals. We got all the decorations. We got all that. The bridegroom is coming. Set everything up. The virgins who are ready go in to the celebration. Those who aren't ready are told, well, you know, you don't have oil for your lamp. You've got to go get some. You don't have your scriptures, you better go get a Bible. When do you need to have your Bible filled, your, your, your life filled with healing scriptures? Now. It's, 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 it's tough when a suddenly, disastrously comes in your life physically and you need to go get scriptures in because you've never had them before. I, I don't know of anybody in my experience, I'm sure it's happened, but in my experience, it's too late. If you haven't been listening to scriptures about healing before, what, what good are they going to do now? Because you haven't primed your pump. You're not a believer. If, you know, if, if you haven't prayed before, oh no, I better pray. That prayer's not going to do you much good. Prayer is conversation. If you've been meaning to have a conversation with somebody who's a good friend and you've been meaning to, to have it, meaning to have it, meaning to have it, and all of a sudden a suddenly comes and they're incapacitated too late to have the conversation. You should have you had it before. If only I had. If I had only done this, if I had only said this. I can't tell you in life how many times I've talked with people where a loved one has died and they have great regrets over words they never shared, things they never spoke. I, I, I've been through, through times when somebody's died in a family and they never even made basic plans, never even talked about it. And the wife says, 
I don't, I don't know where his bank accounts are. I don't know if he has an insurance policy or not. I don't know these things. And if you could wake him back from the dead, he would probably say, well, I thought I had more time. I was going to do that. 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 No, no, no. Suddenlies and unexpectedness is a sign of the time of the end. And Yeshua's answer was this, that because you don't know, you keep watch. Because you don't know, you keep watch. That's good advice wherever you are. In life, if you're in a situation you don't know, keep watch. If you're driving your car in an area of the state you've never been in before, pay attention. You should do that all the time anyway, but, but pay more attention if you're driving on roads you don't know. If you're entering into a conversation with people you don't know, pay attention. You don't know where they're likely to go. Well, I, I just unexpectedly got caught in this situation. Why did you get unexpectedly caught in the situation? Because you weren't watching out. Well, you know, I mean, I went to so-and-so's house, and, 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 and they were doing things that, that I sh we shouldn't have done, but I just got caught off guard. Why? Because you weren't watching out. See, this is not just about end times. This is about developing a lifestyle where I am on guard to the unexpected and suddenlies of life. Mark chapter 13, you don't need to look it up. Yeshua says this. No one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. And there he uses the analogy of the servant. How many times have, have you promised somebody you'd do something and you're counting on, well, I'll get it done by such and such a day, but they come early. You know, if you got an assignment for your boss in the workplace, I used to tell people, if your boss says it's due Friday, make sure it's done Wednesday or Thursday. Always be ahead. Who knows but that suddenly he comes in and says, Where's that pro? Who knows that you were planning to do it Friday so you could give it to him at 5 o'clock on Friday because he said Friday and you've got till 5 o'clock. How many of you have ever had the experience, I've got till such and such a time, and then a suddenly or unexpected comes and interrupts your schedule and now you don't have any time left on Friday because you had to spend it with this and now you can't complete the job. That's a quick way as an employee to demonstrate your lack of doing what it takes. You know why they call them deadlines. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah, turn them into lifelines. Get them, get, get. I, I always have these lifelines because I'm a head of time. Suddenlies can take place. Listen, Paul in 1 Thessalonians f chapter 5 writes to the th Christians and says this, now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly, as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Suddenly it's come. And in this case, he gets hold of something from the Old Testament prophets, when people are running around saying all is well, peace and safety is the time you need to watch out. Don't put your guard down. Stay on alert. In the book of Revelation chapter 3, we read earlier in this, in this series about the church in Sardis. And Yeshua says to that church, remember therefore what you have received and heard, obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. 
So back to Revelation 16 where we started. Look, I'm coming like a thief. His coming is going to be unexpected in terms of its hour. We can know the signs and we should get our bags packed. How blessed are those who stay alert and keep their clothes clean. I looked up some of the Greek words in that sentence. I found some interesting things. Gregorio means to stay awake, alert, and give strict attention to. When he says stay awake, stay alert, this is with keen expectation that something is going to happen. My expectors are out. I remember Brother Copeland early in his ministry when he was uh, preaching, he would say what his father had said to him, get your catchers on. I'm going to say something important. Get your catchers on. Listen up. This is important. I had a professor and a teacher in high school. Always, I, I, it was just great the way he did it. He was a history teacher, and I loved history. But he'd be teaching along, and he'd say, now this is important. And I quickly realized everything he said, now this is important, was going to show up on a test. If he said this is important, it's going to show up on a test. Amazing, you know, highlighting, wake up, stay alert, uh, be, be attentive. If, if you knew that all of a sudden somebody was going to bring you the publisher's clearinghouse, knock at the door that's going to deliver $10 million to you, and the, the, the thing was this way, we don't know when he's coming, but it's going to be sometime this week. But if you're not there, you don't get it. I would not only be there, I would be there. Come on. I mean, have, 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 has UPS ever delivered a package to you and you didn't even know they were there? Happens to me, I'll go out and oh, wait, wait, you know, they didn't ring the bell. Or if they rang the bell, I didn't hear it. Or who knows what, something gets delivered and I don't, don't know. Well, what if the delivery was only going to take place if I signed for it? I'm going to stay awake. I'm going to be alert. I'm going to be doing things in the house, and I hear a car in the street. I'm going to go to the window and look. Oh, that's not it. And I'm doing something else, and I hear a truck, and I go and look. I'm down in the basement doing something. All of a sudden, I, I hear a car door or a truck door slam. I go out through the garage door and look. What am I? I'm alert because I'm expecting something. That's the Greek word, Gregorial, to stay awake alert. It's not stay awake like this. It's to stay awake with, with high expectation. Now listen, if you've got to stay awake, and it's tough, but the reason you're staying awake doesn't have joy attached to it, it's hard to stay awake. It's, it's amazing. You know, in, in, in my life of counseling couples, I've noticed something. I've noticed that a young man will work all day long, get in his car, and drive five or six hours to visit the object of his affection. He'll visit with her, drive five or six hours back to his place, go to work the next day, and do this day after day after day. But then, several years after he's married, he comes home from work, and can't stay awake one hour to talk to her. It's a good place for some of you women to say amen. <laughs> you know, you know it, it's like, what's the difference? The attitude, the expectation, the excitement. That we are to be looking for, forward to the, the coming of Yeshua at any moment. It's going to be a suddenly. Here we go. I wonder if we're going to have enough time to say here we go. It's in the twinkling of an eye, the sound of a shofar. In, in the twinkling of an eye and the sound of the shofar, when they play the shofar, they play it longer than the twinkling of an eye. So it's going to be in the first twinkling of the eye of the sound, and you will know it. Remember when that woman touched the hem of Yeshua's garment? And she knew that immediately she was healed. She knew it. She felt the change in her. In a twinkling of an eye, you're going to feel the change. Now, you say, well, Pastor, what's that feel like? Don't know. But I know that I will know. 
So that if we're walking down the street and all of a sudden that happens, you go, whoa, this is it. I think that should be the last words that people around me should hear. This is it. And bam, I'm gone. Or I'm out of here. That's a good one. See y'all later. Listen, the, the suddenlies, the Gregorio says, we're going to stay awake. We're going to stay alert for it. God wants to do things suddenly. Breakthrough is always suddenly. Be ready. Get your bags packed suddenly. Somebody comes in and there's a, and, and again, somebody has a gift that they're going to give to you, be prepared to receive it. Be always ready for promotion. I'm, I'm, I'm prepared for promotion. I, I live my life prepared for promotion. I remember walking around the campus at, at Compact down in Houston. Somebody says, do you always wear a tie? I said, yes. Because most of the people I worked with didn't. Why do you always wear a tie? I don't need a tie for the job I'm in. But I may need a tie for the job that I'd like to have. And see that big building over there? There's six buildings down there. You see that big building over there? I walk through there regularly because they have this indoor thing that you could walk around from building to building. When I'm on my way over there, I always walk through that building. You know the people in those buildings? They all wear ties. You know why they all, all wear ties? Because they got important jobs that pay good money. Do you know what I'd like to have? An important job that pays good money. So I want to dress for the job I want, not the, the job I've got. Dress for instant promotion. If all of a sudden I get in an elevator and there's a man in a business suit there that says, hi, I'm Vice President so-and-so. Who are you? I'm Don Long. What do you do? I do thus and thus and thus and thus. Oh, tell me about it. On the way from the bottom up to the top, do you think I could uh, give him a three-minute a capsule of what I do and my contribution to the company and at the end of three minutes if he said I'd like to interview you I said I'm ready right now oh I gotta go put my resume together no my resume was always up to date I wasn't dissatisfied with the job I had not at all I was just always ready for promotion are you ready to be promoted to glory are you ready to be promoted to glory are you ready to step into eternity or are you like the foolish virgins who say, oh, God, i got to go take care of some things. Please don't come now. I've got some things undone. I promised you I would do. I haven't done. Or are you asleep at the switch? Gregorio means to stay awake. The second word I looked at is terio. Terio. And that means to attend or to carefully guard. To stay alert to, to has these two words. And this one means to attend to carefully, to guard it. Now, I only know that you got to guard valuables. I don't guard things that aren't valuable. When I'm walking in a, in a place, uh, Jerusalem is one of those places, <laughs> by the way, I'm very conscious of the wallet in my pocket. There's a lot of tourists in, in, Jer in Jerusalem. There's a lot of pickpockets in Jerusalem. I, you know, I'm, I'm not clasping it with my hand. I'm just very conscious. What am I do? I'm guarding it by paying attention to it. I'm guarding it by paying attention to it. And so the word is that we've, we've got to guard. This staying alert is in the sense of guarding it, to guard, to attend carefully to the faith that I've got. And then the last thing I found was very interesting is the word hemation. Hemation is the garment. I thought it was interesting. This is how blessed are those who, who stay alert, who attend carefully, and keep, that, that's a, that attending, keeping, attending their clothes. It's a garment. I mean, that seems like a strange thing. I mean, if, if I were living in life, Jordan, you were just telling me this other day. Jordan and Donna were down in Texas. And while I would be working, they would leave the hotel and go for little walks. And one day they're walking along and there was like a little little riverbank going there. As they walked along, they looked down on the riverbank and there was a, some men's clothing, a shirt, some pants, neatly folded, and shoes sitting on top of it. Put two and two together. Somewhere in that river, there's a man without his clothes. You know, if, if, if you went down there and took his clothes, 
he's in trouble because this was right off a major highway there. You know, it's like no place to go. <laughs> Nothing to sneak into, you know. And, and so when I, when I first started reading this, it's like this, this garment, stay alert, keep your clothes on or keep your clothes handy or keep your clothes clean. Any of those you want to choose so that, so that you won't be walking around naked and be publicly put to shame. I don't know. In all the big things in the end times, keep my clothes clean? Sounds like your mom. Keep your, keep, always have clean, always have clean underwear on. You never know, you know, you might go to the hospital or something. You got to have clean underwear. Always have clean underwear, you know, and no holes. Oh, God forbid you have holes in it. You, you never know. You spend your whole life. I'm always got clean clothes because you never know. Um, and, and so it seems strange, you know, when I was reading this, that stay alert and keep your clothes clean. Does that strike anybody odd? Keep your clothes clean, keep your clothes handy, keep, I mean, guard them. So I looked up that word, I just told you what it was, and it means specifically an outer garment. It's a garment that you wear on the outside. Now, I don't know about you, but I have clothes that I wear on the outside and clothes that I wear on the inside. So if, I'm, if I've got a work day, the clothes I wear, I'll put a shirt on, it's my work shirt. It's filled with stains. It's got paint on it, a little bit of leftover glue. But it's nice, it's comfortable, I put it on. But when I go to the store, I put an outer garment on because that's what I'm going to wear for the world to see. What is it that you and I are to be wearing for the world to see? We talked about it several weeks ago. The works of righteousness. Well, I don't want to look different than the world. You better look different than the world because that's your garment. If you look like the world, then to God you look naked. That when the trumpet sounds, when we are out of here, we're going to be clothed in our works. You're not saved by your works, but you are clothed in them. The good deeds we talked about in that sermon about the good deeds, what good is faith without deeds, the good deeds are a garment you wear. The mitzvahs are tangible in the kingdom of God. Come on. The body that you're going to be having in the kingdom of God is not the flesh and blood body like this. And the garments you wear, because you will be wearing garments, are not woven of cotton and polyester. They're woven of the mitzvahs or the good deeds you've done. Keep your good deeds current with you and keep them clean. Don't let your good deeds get contaminated so that when the call comes, I mean, you ever, you've seen rapture films, surely you have, tribulation films, and, and what happens? You know, it ha in the one in the airplane, all the clothes are neatly piled in the, on the seat. You know, we, we, we rise to meet the Lord in the air. Well, what's, what's left behind? Your shoes, your clothes, I'm always amazed that they're neatly folded. I mean, they don't just fall in a heap. I would think if I left my body, this is just going to be, but, but they're all neatly folded and everything like that. So when I first started reading about the rapture and thinking, you know, you know, it could come right now. We're all going to leave. We're going to go right through the roof. We don't need, rapture's coming, everybody outside. No, 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 your body's instantly transformed like your shoe as it goes through material things. But if our clothes drop off, is there really going to be 
thousands of naked people floating up through the air? Come on, I mean, I used to... We have a glorified body. Oh, I've got a glorified body. Okay, so I've, I'm, I'm, I'm a body, but I'm radiating, I'm radiating light. Well, what is the quality of the light coming from? It's the light of your works, your mitzvahs. Remember when the Bible says that some people get to heaven, all our works are going to be thrown into a fire? What's wood, hay, and stubble is going to be consumed, tossed out? What's left, the gold, is going to be cast into crowns. And it says there that some people will have nothing. That's what he's talking about. That we don't want to be in bed. I, he's not saying you're going to be walking around heaven in the nude and we're all going to go, oh, oh, you know. No. You're going to be missing the clothing of works. Now, if you're missing it there, what do we know? Then there's no testimony here. Come on, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, one of our favorite things about God wants to bless us and bring money into our lives and so forth. Why? So we can be a blessing. And the world will see God through what we give. They'll see God through what we do. Our works will bring glory to God. Our attitudes, our lifestyle, the way we talk, the way we live. When you wear your flesh garment with discouragement on it, with, with a fallen face on it, when you wear your flesh garment in the world like you're carrying the weight of the world, you have nothing to wear in the kingdom of God. But when you let the joy of the Lord fill you and you see people and your eyes light up and it's good to see you, and you're excited to see them, and your body is an extension of God, then what you find out is that becomes a garment that you're wearing that is bright in the eyes of the kingdom of God. Now, let me tell you who else it's bright in. It's very bright in the eyes of one who cannot stand light. It's very bright in the eyes of of Satan. When you and I both, this is why he wants to get, well, do, do good things, but don't brag. We don't want you to be bragging. You're not bragging on you. I'm bragging on God. Look what God has done. Look what God is doing. And if the devil can keep us, keep your little light hidden, keep it shine. Just look, I'm not better than anyone else. I'm just like you. No, you're not just like the world. No way. Let your joy light up your life. Your speech, that's why it says your speech should be seasoned with graciousness. Christians have no business using profanity, no business speaking Lashon Hurrah negatively about other people. Let your speech be light, and what it does is it shines in the face of the devil. When you're going through challenging times, let the joy of the Lord fill your life. That's like turning a bright, he's the one that brought it. You just turn a big spotlight right in his eyes and say, take that. Take that. The light of my joy, the, the light of my belief in God, the, the light of my faith that continues to go. I'm going to keep it always ready. So when the suddenly comes, I'm well dressed. The clothing of the good works. Stay awake. Stay alert. So let me close with this now. You still with me? Paul, back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I read part of that passage earlier, but he gives instructions for end time living. If you were to say to me, well, pastor, I'm born again. I'm filled with the Spirit. I, I just want to know what, what, what are some key things that I need to know on how to live the Christian life. I would say go read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 4 through 9 and 12 through 22. And if you just take that one chapter, 1 Thessalonians 5 and those verses, and you meditate them every single day, and you strive to do that, you will be well along the road to a successful Christian life. Listen to this. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, 
but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, here we go, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. Be joyful always. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you and Yeshua the Messiah. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. You're mature in the Lord. You can, you can do your own digging in this, this chapter. I'd be tempted to preach on it, but it would take several hours to go through it. <laughs> Amen? But li listen, these are things, these are all commands. You know when people say, well, I, I'm not under law because I'm a New Testament Christian. There are 2,000 commands in the New Testament. Actually, a little more, but 2,000 rounds a month. 2,000 commands. These are all imperatives in Greek. Be joyful always isn't... This is good counsel. I would like to counsel you. Tr try being a little more cheerful. It'll help you. Really, now. I'm, I'm a good counselor. I'm just telling you. Be a little more cheerful now. That's a command from God to a believer. Well, you know, I just don't, I just don't think the pastor understands me, you know, wants me to be cheerful. He's not going through what I'm going through. I didn't write it. And I maybe gave it to you as a suggestion. God is saying, be joyful always. That's a command. You either do it or you don't. And when you're not doing it, you have offended and rebelled against God. You're in rebellion and disobedience to the one you call Abba that you want to help you. Be joyful always. I don't see that it says be joyful always unless it's a holocaust. Be joyful always unless you get fired from your job. Be joyful always except if you lose your house. Be joyful always. You know, no, no. Be joyful always is independent. Pray continually. Well, you know, if you'd really like to get close to God, I would suggest that maybe you might want to pray a little more. Just a suggestion. I wouldn't want to command you. That's a command. That is a command from God. You can't tell me on one hand, well, I believe the Bible's the Word of God, inspired by the Word of God, every word of it. Well, come on, that's a command of God. Well, I don't like that command. Now, how do I pray continually? Am I supposed to go in my closet and shut the door and pray all the time? Ah, that means you don't understand prayer. Prayer is constant fellowship. Prayer is communication. What he's saying is go through every single moment of your day in constant communication with your Abba who is there with you. And if you'll do that, you're following the, the command of God. You may never have a formal prayer that day because you've got constant communication. Give thanks in all circumstances. It doesn't say give thanks for them, but in the midst of them, I give thanks to God because he is my God. In the end, I know everything's going to be okay. Live in peace with each other. That, that's a command of God. <laughs> You know, I can tell you how long I've been a pastor and people would come to me and say, I don't understand why I'm believing this stuff, I'm confessing this stuff, and it's not working. It says right there, live in peace with each other. And you can't be peaceful with each other. It might be your husband, it might be your wife, it might be your child, it might be a fellow believer, but wait, you're angry at them, you're upset with them. That's a violation of a command of God as clear as the Ten Commandments. Would you go out and sacrifice a pig to a pagan altar? Oh, I would never do that. Well, then why are you carrying grudges with one another? That's a violation of a command of God. Glory to God. Encourage the timid. Help the weak. Be patient with 
everyone. Make sure nobody pays back wrong for wrong. Doesn't say make sure nobody pays back wrong for right. Somebody did something right, don't you pay him back wrong? Well, we'd understand that. No, no, the command is, when you do me wrong, I am not allowed to do wrong. And then Yeshua said, as a man thinks, in his heart, so he is. So I'm not even allowed to think wrong. Well, I'd never do it, but mm, I can think about it. No. When you do me wrong, I am under a command of the Lord of the church to respond in kindness to you. What are we to be doing? What are the instructions for living in the end times? We have got to start guarding ourselves because these are the things that the enemy is going to bring to keep us out of position. To keep us out of position. Satan is frightened more than anything by you getting it right. If he was so powerful, you wouldn't have gotten born again. He would have dropped you dead before that happened. I think I might like to give my life to, to Yeshua. Bam, he'd kill you right then if he was so powerful. He's not powerful. He couldn't stop you from getting born again. But he can sure put all his effort into keeping you from becoming the child of God you're destined to be. Keep you caught up in the beggarly elements of the world. Keep you caught up in the affairs that are going on in relationships at work or relationships with this one offended me or this one is wrong or this one is... He can keep us bogged down by that. But we can keep guard. We can keep guard. Now, my closing illustration to you is <laughs> we are the bride. We are the bride of Christ. And guess what? He's coming for the bride. When he comes, that trumpet is going to sound saying, here he is. I don't want to be out here in the field doing something I shouldn't be doing. I don't want to be in another place watching what I shouldn't be watching. I, want to be, I don't want to be in the wrong place when there's a moed that he's coming for. I want to be in the right place just like the expectant bride every day. Maybe this is the day my husband's coming for me. Maybe this is the day. Because when that day happens from here on, it's all glory. It could be today. The question is, are you ready? Your job and my job is to stay awake, stay alert, and keep our clothes clean. Did you get anything out of this? Father, we do thank you and praise you for your love for us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for instructing us, getting us in position so that in these end years of this history, we can reflect the light and glory of how good our God is. Oh, thank you, Abba. You've equipped us with everything we need. We just need to start living it out. So, Holy Spirit, we yield to you, to your guidance, to your leading. Think through us. Speak through us, act through us. May we see how Yeshua sees. May we feel how Abba feels. May we say only what needs to be said as you lead us to those words. May our lives be so changed in this year that we don't even recognize who we are. We will know we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine.